Um, we in the admissions office are so willing and ready to help each and every one of you with any questions you may have about any part of that process. So once again, I'm Katherine Dreyer, the admissions counselor. We have Rebecca Stafford, who is our director, Mark Reese, our college relations manager, and Stacy Woods, our admissions clerk. Any of us is available to help you at any time, so grab us today and ask any questions you might have, and we're also always available via phone and email. But I want to take a few minutes to speak to you, few that are at the beginning of the process. You might not know where to start, what do you need to get together to apply, what should I do today, especially if you want to be considered for fall 2013. So a little bit about the admissions package. Obviously, you're going to need to take the LSAT, the Law School Admissions Test. We're going to look at your undergraduate GPA, the application itself, two letters of recommendation, your resume, your personal statement, and the Credential Assembly Service Report through the LSAC. It sounds like a lot, but it's really all centralized in the LSAC website, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. Um, additionally, the application fee is $50, but if you all check your packets, you have a little card that has a fee waiver code for you. So that fee will be waived if you have not yet applied. So once again, for those of you at the beginning of the process and you want to know where to start, there's three areas that I think you should really be focusing on right this minute. First is the LSAT. We do to accept the June scores if you want to be considered for the fall. So therefore, when you leave today, go to the LSAC, LSAC website, lsac.org, and register for the LSAT and get going. I definitely think it's important to take a preparation program because the LSAT is different from any test you will ever take. And you can hear that over and over again, but if you take it, you'll understand. So definitely the prep programs are really important and so helpful because they can help you get a return on the investment you make when you spend money on it in the form of scholarship opportunities. I mentioned the LSAC, that's the Law School Admissions Council. And if you visit their website, there's a wealth of resources about law school admissions. And once you join their services, you can go to forums across the country to meet all sorts of law schools. Like I said, you can apply on their website. You can just upload everything there to one centralized location. It makes the process a little bit easier. And once again, if you have any problems with the LSAC website or with the application process, just call us and we can help you out. And I know the folks at LSAC are wonderful as well. And then the last thing that I really think you need to start focusing on now, because it takes a little bit more time than you might think, is the personal statement, um, which is this the two to three page, why you want to go to law school, who you are. It's our opportunity to see what makes you unique, what makes you you, why you want to be a lawyer, why you have a passion for the law. It's so important, and you think, oh, it's fine, it's two to three pages, but it really does take a great amount of time, and you want to make sure it's grammatically correct, the spelling is correct, that it makes sense, that you're really proud of what you put into it. And so it does tend to take a little bit of time and you might go through a few drafts. And just in the end, you want to put your best foot forward. So make sure that everything you give to us is the best you and that you're proud of everything that you give. And once again, never hesitate to get to know us. Come to campus for a visit. Sit in a class. Take a tour. This is a great step that you've taken just being here today, um, getting to know the program. Um, but never hesitate to come to campus as many times as you want and get to know us. So, And at this time, we'd like to introduce um, Professor Rapping. He is the director of the program and also a professor of law. So please, Mr. Rapping, Professor Rapping. Good, good. It's really, it's great to be here. It's great to see all of you. I have to tell you, I have been a lawyer now for almost 20 years. I don't know a single one of my friends who's not a lawyer, and most of my friends who are, who can say that they have never had a day in their professional life where they haven't really been incredibly fulfilled with what they do. I wake up every day, and I work hard, I work long hours, I might be tired, I might be stressed, but there's never been a day that I haven't truly loved what I'm doing. And I think that that's what the practice of law can offer to you. If you go into this for the right reason, if you go into this career because you want to make a difference, you could have a career that is fulfilling every single day. And I think that's what we are trying to jumpstart in your careers with the Honors Program in Criminal Justice. Now there's a, a symbol, probably the most common symbol you see when it comes to, uh, to the word law, are these scales. What do they mean? Law, is an in, law school is an interactive process, so we'll start now. What do they mean? Everyone is equal. What do they mean to you? Have you ever thought about what these scales mean? What are we balancing? 
anything that a person may need. And, and the law okay. is making sure everything is equal. Balanced. Equal. Justice. 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 When I think of these scales in the criminal justice context, I think a lot of what we're talking about is, if you're entering careers in criminal justice, one thing we are trying to do is to figure out right, what the right consequences are for engaging in behavior that society says is inappropriate. So on the one hand, we have to determine consequences, but that always has to be tempered with justice, fairness, compassion, and learning how to get that balance right is a skill that we teach here at John Marshall. When I think about justice, um, I think uh, Dean Lynn mentioned Kafka, the trial. Has anyone read the trial? If you're going to do some reading before you come to law school, one book I recommend is The Trial. No, not Grisham, The Trial. There's a book called The Trial by Franz Kafka. Although you can read Grisham, The Trial, too, if you want some light reading. But, but, but Kafka wrote a book called The Trial about Joseph K. And Joseph K. was a man who was accused of a crime, thrown into a criminal justice system, and he was lost in this criminal justice system. He had no idea what he was charged with. It was a very impersonal system. And it's become sort of the symbol. You hear the term Kafkaesque. It's this symbol of being lost in a system with no one to assist you, with nowhere to turn. In sort of modern history, right, we can look to Nazi Germany as a symbol of what can happen when there is a government that points to a group of people and says we want to punish them and there is no one there to stand by their side. Right? That totalitarian ideal, right? it's not what we believe in here in America. And the law and lawyers are meant to resist our government from going down that path, right? It's an incredibly important field in that sense. This, this month we're celebrating, does anyone know who this is? Gideon. Clarence Earl Gideon, right? It was literally 50 years ago this month that the Supreme Court handed down the decision, Gideon versus Wainwright. Anyone know what that stands for? If, if you're charged with a crime, you're entitled to a lawyer. That's what everyone thinks Gideon stands for. That is primarily what Gideon stands for, but it stands for something bigger. Right? It stands for this idea that in our criminal justice system, justice doesn't depend on how much money you have. Ju Judge, uh, Justice Hugo Black said, there can be no equal justice where the kind of trial a man gets depends on the amount of money he has. We believe in that deeply. That is a deeply American ideal. And it's incredibly important in this criminal justice system because 80% of people who are in our criminal justice system are poor. 80% of the people in this criminal justice system rely on court-appointed lawyers, right? The lawyers that are now required as a result of Gideon. For those, so for those of us who enter this field, whether we are entering it as defenders of the accused, whether we're entering it as prosecutors who are beholden to ensure that justice is done, it is critical that we remember the scales, that we remember the balance, right? And that we, that we have the skills and the tools and the heart and the motivation to make sure that we're living up to these ideals. Now, there's a, another symbol that I stole from the Kentucky Department of Advocacy. They engaged in a campaign called Justice Jeopardized because they are experiencing what criminal justice systems all over this country are experiencing, and that is that many of our criminal justice systems are broken or breaking. Right? And, uh, and, and there is a real question, and there's been, we've galvanized around this anniversary of Gideon to say, how can we solve this problem of the broken system? Let me share with you sort of some ideas or some thoughts about how the, or some, some examples of how the system is broken. Um, there, are, th there was an article I recently read, written by a prosecutor out of the Harris County Prosecutor's Office in Houston. And she, she uh, joined with a law professor from the University of Houston, and they wrote this law review article where they did a study, and they, and they, and they concluded that prosecutors in large cities around this country 
Many of them handle hundreds of cases at a time and will handle over a thousand cases in a year. In Houston alone, prosecutors at any given time can be handling as many as 500 felonies. Prosecutors in Houston are closing, are handling 1,500 felonies a year. Now, if you think about everything you need to do to live up to your obligations to justice as a prosecutor, you need to investigate, you need to make sure you understand what happened, you need to make sure you understand who the defendant is as well as who the victim is so you can make sure you are promoting justice. How can you do that with those caseloads? On the defense side, the American Bar Association has recommended that no defense attorney will handle more than 150 felony cases in a year. Yet we have defense public defenders who routinely handle two, three, four times that amount. There was a young public defender I worked with here in Georgia who was, who was in an unnamed county, but she, wrote, she left. She wrote a letter to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution on her way out. And her letter said, I came to this work because I wanted to make a difference. And I find that in the last 13 months, I've closed 900 cases. She said, I have no resources to get an investigator. I have no resources to hire expert witnesses to deal with things like forensic evidence. And I feel like I am giving in to the status quo. And so she left. And so she left that job. And when lawyers leave the criminal justice system, as opposed to coming into it to think about how together we can fix it, it ensures that the next generation is going to inherit the same criminal justice system. Right? And that's why I think it's our duty to make sure that we have young lawyers coming out of John Marshall, going into criminal justice systems across Georgia and across the country, right? and helping to solve this problem. When I think about Justice, there are a number of faces that come to mind. I want to share a couple with you. And then I'm going to get into the specifics of the honors program. Um, oh, but I wanted to mention to you, so, so, so this, we've got this, 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 this system that is just completely overburdened. And, and one other thing I want to mention is there are plenty of parts, plenty of places in this country, and right here in Georgia, where this problem, the huge influx of people in the criminal justice system is dealt with through the plea process. And there are places that have become plea mills because quite literally the lawyers in those systems have lost all sight of justice, right? They've had really these high ideals that we talk, that, we, that the scales represent, literally beaten out of them by a system that is just overburdened. And so you have these plea mills where you can see, there are parts of Georgia you can walk into a courtroom and you can see you can see dozens of people filing into court. They talk to their lawyer for a few minutes, and they enter guilty pleas right there that day. Because quite frequently, that is the only chance they have to get out that day. Otherwise, they'll be given a bond they can't make. And they'll sit there for months waiting for trial. We have to fix that. We need lawyers to fix that. Lawyers have stepped up historically in this country to the greatest challenges the world's ever known. And lawyers have solved them. We had a time in this country where there were no child labor laws. Right? Children as young as six could be sent to factories for 12, 14, 16 hours a day. Lawyers changed that through legislation. We had a time in this country where African Americans and whites couldn't drink at the same water fountains or go to the same schools. Lawyers, Thurgood Marshall, changed that. Right? So we need lawyers to change this. And I think about people like Eddie Joe Lloyd. Eddie Joe Lloyd was a man who was a, a, accused of kidnapping and raping and killing a young girl on her way to school. He was a mentally challenged man in Michigan, Detroit, Michigan. And he was given a lawyer who didn't care very much about the law. And what that lawyer did um, was basically almost nothing, except withdraw from, from the case six days before trial. A new lawyer was appointed who didn't seek a continuance, didn't file any motions. Eddie Joe Lloyd went to trial without the, without the assistance of, of, of a meaningful lawyer and was convicted and sentenced to die. Well, he was given a lawyer to write his appeal. That lawyer never visited him and wouldn't accept his collect phone calls. The lawyer filed an appeal. What do you think happened? The appeal was denied. 
Well, Eddie Joe Lloyd got a new set of lawyers, a set of lawyers who care, a set of lawyers like the people we're producing here at John Marshall. And they represented him in a post-conviction proceeding, arguing that his appellate lawyer was ineffective. His appellate lawyer was asked what he thought about that. And this is what his appellate lawyer had to say about his client. This is a sick individual who raped, kidnapped, and strangled a young woman on her way to school. His claim of my wrongdoing is frivolous, just as is his existence. Both should be terminated. What chance do you have if you are given an advocate like that? Right? We are committed to making sure that no one our graduates represent have an advocate like that. Right? That's, an, that, that's an example of a defense attorney who truly doesn't understand justice. On the other side of the V, I think about a man who's a friend of mine and Professor Saviello's, John Thompson. John Thompson was Convict, was accused and convicted of a robbery and a murder in New Orleans. And he was uh, locked up. He ended up being locked up for 18 years. Well, about 11 or 12 years into his incarceration, the prosecutor who handled his case was on his deathbed. And so he made an admission to another prosecutor, and he said, you know, I had a swatch of blood that came from the perpetrator. And it didn't match John Thompson, and I hid it. I suppressed it. He then died. His colleague, the other prosecutor, what do you think he did? No. Nothing. He did nothing. Several years later, John Thompson is about to be executed. And on his deathbed, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, on the eve of his execution, he had a lawyer who was a very hardworking lawyer and an investigator, and the investigator started combing through microfiche in a last-ditch effort to save his client. And he found that swatch, and he revealed that swatch, and as a result, John Thompson's convictions were overturned. His life was spared. He was an innocent man. And he was given an award. He sued the state of, or the, the state of Louisiana and won a $14 million verdict. Well, that case went up to the Supreme Court because Louisiana appealed. And they said, it may be that our lawyers, our prosecutors, don't understand justice, but it's not our obligation to teach them, right? They're supposed to learn that in law school. John Thompson had his reward, his, his, his award uh, taken away from him. He lost that $14 million, he got nothing. And Justice Scalia said, I agree with the state. Lawyers should be learning this in law school. So it's critical, it's imperative that we are teaching you all, to leave law school understanding what justice means. And so let me tell you a little bit about how we do that through the honors program in criminal justice. This is, a, this is the, 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 the first year core curriculum for the traditional program in criminal justice, and it's all on the website. But, but essentially, if, if you come to John Marshall through our traditional program, you will still be exposed to a faculty of incredibly committed te teachers and lawyers. And you will still be exposed to, I think, some of the best teachers in the country. Um, and I encourage you to do that if, if you choose at the end of the day that criminal justice is not something you want to focus on. Um, but if you come to our traditional program, you will have a first-year curriculum that looks a lot like curricula, curricula across the country, where you will take torts, property, civil procedure, contracts, and legal research and writing. In some law schools, you will also take criminal law in your first year. Um, and that will be your first-year curriculum. In your second year, you will take criminal law and criminal procedure. That's the first-year curriculum at John Marshall in the traditional program. In the honors program, we've actually... Uh, revamped the curriculum just for those in the honors program in criminal justice to try to achieve three things. First, we want to make sure that it is integrated. So we've created a curriculum where not only are you taking more criminal law related courses, and not only do you start taking them earlier in your law school career, but we, but we work to make sure that they are integrated, they work together, and you understand how each of these classes fit together in the larger practice of criminal law. So in that sense, it's integrated. It's applied. 
It's applied in the sense that we want to make sure that not only are you learning the theory, not only are you learning the doctrine, but you understand how to apply that in a very practical way. And finally, it is practical. So when I went to law school, I never had a professor that ever practiced criminal law. I didn't start talking to people who knew how to practice criminal law until I did my internships and I graduated and became a lawyer. Most law schools hire law professors either right out of law school or right off of a judicial clerkship. And they're looking for people who think about the law, who write about the law, who theorize about the law. But what we do here at John Marshall is we look for people who know how to practice law. And so every law professor here, I don't think we have a law professor here who has less than six or seven years of practical experience, and many have much more. I never had that. And so we think about how to teach you how to take, take these lessons and put them into practice. And so in your first year at John Marshall, you will not only take torts, civil procedure, property, and contracts, and you'll take a, few, uh, a, few less, a couple less credits of each. So we can also fit in criminal law and criminal procedure in your first year. Your legal research and writing course will be a criminal law-based problem, and it will be integrated. We will work on the, on the legal research and writing problem and weave it in and out of what you're learning in criminal law and criminal procedure. And you'll take an additional course called Intro to Criminal Justice, where we'll think about the, the stories of people like John Thompson and Eddie Joe Lloyd and other challenges that can face lawyers in the, in the system and develop strategies so you can think about how you can effectively operate in the real world. In your second year, you take evidence, advanced criminal procedure um, in the first semester. And those courses, along with your first year courses, are also integrated with a problem. You will get a problem when you come into John Marshall that you will start building on every semester. In criminal law, you'll get a piece of that problem. In criminal procedure, you'll get a little bit more. In evidence, you'll get a little bit more. In advanced crim pro, you'll get a little bit more. And in the second semester of your second year, you will take six credit hours of something called integrated criminal practice, which Professor Saviello teaches. And there you will take that problem you've been thinking about for three semesters, and you will use it to both engage in pretrial pra practice and trial advocacy in a very practical way. So it's the only program in the country that not only has you put a case together, but also has you try it both at the pretrial and trial stages. Unlike other schools that routinely only offer trial advocacy. We teach you how to build that case before you ever come to trial. In your last year, you will have two semesters of externships where you will take what you've learned and apply them in a real world setting. And you're gonna meet some of our externship supervisors in a few minutes. You'll take not only professional responsibility, which every law student takes, but you'll take a, a, a second course in criminal law ethics where you can think about how to, how to take these principles of professional responsibility and apply them in a practical way to criminal law settings. And then you, you will have a host of electives and you certainly can, we have many great professors, both full-time faculty and adjuncts who have practiced for a long time who teach a, a variety of criminal law related ethics. So that's the curriculum and finally the faculty. We have a faculty that jointly has roughly 100 years of experience, practical experience in the field doing this work. I teach in the program, but the folks that I teach come by my office long after the course is over to continue to talk to me, to continue to brainstorm. We really are not just faculty members, we're mentors. We care deeply about your development. And we wanna work with you through, through your three years of law school, and we wanna to continue to work with you beyond law school. So I hope many of you join us. I think if you do, you will have a one-of-a-kind experience. And I think if you do, you will become part of a community of lawyers who really are going out and changing the world. Um, I hope some of you are able to stick around after lunch for uh, uh, an HBO documentary that is coming out in July called Gideon's Army. And it's actually a movie that focuses on 
three public defenders that work in a program that I developed and Tim Saviello and Patrice Fulcher and other faculty members of ours work in it. And it really gives you a sense of how these lawyers are dealing with real world challenges, making a difference and changing the world. So I invite you to join us and to have a, an incredibly fulfilling career. Thanks. Thank you.